May 12, 1932. Charles Lindbergh was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1902, the only child his parents shared. His father was a U.S. congressman whose staunch opposition of the United States joining World War I ultimately cost him his seat in Congress. His mother was a well-educated chemistry teacher. The small family lived in Detroit, Michigan until their house burned down in 1905. His parents separated when Charles was seven years old. He moved a lot, all around the country, ultimately attending over a dozen schools. Unsurprisingly, schooling wasn't his forte. Charles was always interested in the way motors worked, studying the mechanisms unique to different modes of transportation. His passion started with his family car, then on to his motorcycle, and he naturally became fascinated with the workings of airplanes. His parents convinced him to attend the University of Wisconsin, but he dropped out a year later. In 1922, Charles enrolled at the Nebraska Aircraft Corporation's Flying School and, soon after, began taking flying lessons. He flew with company pilots and learned a great deal about the mechanics of airplanes. Charles needed to pay for flying lessons, and the most lucrative and exciting way to go about that was to go barnstorming. Barnstorming was essentially doing tricks with, or on, a plane. It became somewhat of a trend in the Roaring Twenties. The name barnstorming came from pilots using farmland as a runway to then attract and gather crowds to watch an air show and offer plane rides for a fee in a nearby barn. Barnstorming consisted of stunt pilots who did spins, dives, and barrel rolls. Daredevils, or aerialists, walked across the wings of a plane, parachuted, transferred planes in midair, did target shooting, danced, and anything else they could do to risk their lives for cheers, applause, and cash. Charles mainly worked as a wing walker and a parachutist in his barnstorming days. Charles went to Georgia to purchase a plane for $500. That would be around $8,500 today. He made a bit of a name for himself as a barnstormer and became known as Daredevil Lindbergh a name that seems both fitting and yet unimaginative for how dangerous the job was. In 1924, Charles began a year of flight training with the U.S. Army Air Service and received his Army pilot's wings. He graduated at the top of his class, of which only 17% of those who started even finished. He went on to teach flying at the Robertson Corporation and did so until the company was contracted to fly and deliver airmail. Charles became a chief pilot in this very hazardous job, flying between St. Louis, Missouri and Chicago, Illinois. Through terrible weather and night flying, Charles became quite an experienced pilot. Pilots at the time were intrigued by transatlantic flying. A French businessman offered an award of $25,000 for whoever could successfully fly from New York to France. Today, that would be over $400,000. Charles was more than interested, but he could hardly be taken seriously. He was young, only 25, and had little money to fund such an undertaking. In 1927, a small group of businessmen in St. Louis offered financial support. Charles then fittingly named his plane the Spirit of St. Louis. Charles placed an additional gas tank where the front window should have been, and removed everything he possibly could from his plane to make the plane lighter and therefore use less fuel. The trip was an enormous risk. Others had tried and failed, and in this case, failing meant dying. May 20th, 1927, Charles started his flight, departing from Long Island. For 33 and a half hours, the trip was a nail biter. Storm clouds, flying blind for several hours, going as high as 10,000 feet and as low as 10 feet, and using only his intuition, as he had no navigation equipment, Charles arrived in France on May 21st at 10.22 p.m. Around 150,000 people stormed the field in which he landed. The world was in love with the young contest winner. President Calvin Coolidge gave Charles the Distinguished Flying Cross, even though it was only to be given while flying for the military. 
and Congress awarded him with the Medal of Honor, again, even though he was not flying for the military. The post office made a 10 cent stamp of the spirit of St. Louis, and of course, Charles was in just about every newspaper and magazine in existence. In addition to the $25,000 he won for the successful flight, Charles wrote an autobiography for which he earned over $250,000, $4 million in today's money, and he found well-paying jobs working for the Transcontinental Air Transport and Pan American Airways. In his autobiography, Charles described the ideal relationship as being long-term and stable with a woman who had good health, strong genes, and keen intellect. He criticized army cadets for having superficial romances, and he called other pilots womanizers. Charles was quoted as saying, There were times in an airplane when it seemed I had escaped mortality to look down on earth like a god. Charles began dating Elizabeth Morrow, the daughter of a wealthy partner at J.P. Morgan. A few months later, he broke up with Elizabeth for her younger sister, Anne. During that time frame, the youngest Morrow sister, Constance, received a letter that threatened to kidnap and kill her unless a $50,000 ransom was paid. The writer of that letter was never identified. In 1929, Charles married Anne, and the two often went flying together. In fact, when she was seven months pregnant, she flew with him in an open cockpit at high altitude for two weeks. Upon returning home, Anne was hospitalized for several days for unknown reasons. In June of 1930, Charles and Anne had their first baby boy, Charles August Lindbergh, whom they called the Eaglet. The baby was immediately placed on a special diet due to an unusually large head, as well as symptoms of rickets. The Mayo Clinic says that rickets is the softening and weakening of bones in children usually because of an extreme and prolonged vitamin D deficiency, though it can be caused by rare inherited problems. The symptoms of rickets are delayed growth in motor skills, pain in the spine, pelvis, and legs, muscle weakness, bowed legs or knocked knees, thickened wrists and ankles, and breast bone projection. If left untreated, it can lead to an abnormally curved spine, failure to grow, bone deformities, and seizures. Charles was six foot three. A regimented, structured, healthy lifestyle was highly valued, if not demanded, by him. It has been said that Charles made Anne keep track of supposed infractions committed by their children, like chewing gum, and that every penny spent on the household was scrutinized. With his requirement of good health, strong genes, and keen intellect, having a child with a health condition would have caused great insecurity for Charles. I imagine they would have done their best to hide it if there was anything wrong with the baby. The Lindberghs were building a house in an isolated location in New Jersey. They spent some of their time in Anne's family mansion and some in the new home as it was nearly complete. The new home was not just isolated, it was encompassed by trees and sat just about a half a mile away from the road. As regimented as Charles was, they always had the exact same schedule. They spent weekends in the new home and went back to the Morrow Mansion during the week. For the first time, Charles decided they would stay in the new home past Sunday. The only people who knew about this was Anne, the three servants with them, and a few servants back at the Morrow Mansion. The night of March 1st, 1932, Charles was a scheduled speaker at New York University. Though he enjoyed that type of event where he could be the center of attention, he was strangely a no-show. He did, however, call the new home to give stern instructions that no one was allowed to go into the baby's nursery between 8 and 10 p.m. His directive was to ensure that the baby would not be spoiled. Charles arrived at home at 8.25 p.m. A nursemaid went into little Charlie's nursery at 10 p.m. and discovered that he was not in his crib. When she told Anne, the two of them thought that maybe Charles was playing a joke. But when Charles saw the empty crib, he yelled, They've stolen our baby! One of them found a ransom note on the windowsill of the baby's room demanding $50,000. Looking out the window, they saw a ladder was standing up against the wall of the house. Four months shy of his second birthday, 
baby Charles was gone. The ransom note, which the FBI labeled as the nursery note, said, Dear Sir, have $50,000 ready, $25,000 in $20 bills, $25,000 in $10 bills, and $10,000 in $5 bills. After two to four days, we will inform you where to deliver the money. We warn you from making anything public or for notify the police. The child is in good care. Indication for all letters are signature and three holes. That is bad math. 25,000 plus 25,000 plus 10,000 is not 50,000. Anyway, the part about the three holes reference a little insignia used on all of the ransom notes, apparently to ensure that the notes would be authentic. Baby Charles' room was on the second floor. The ladder used to reach the window was broken where parts joined together, said to have been broken while someone was going up or coming down. There were no fingerprints, footprints, blood, or hair. Friends were asked to communicate with the kidnappers, and word spread quickly about the ransom. A second ransom note was received five days later on March 6th, asking for more money. As with the first note, there were many misspellings and weird grammar, and it appeared to be intentionally written with someone's non-dominant writing hand. Page 1. Dear Sir, we have warned you not to make anything public, also notify the police. Now you have to take consequences. It means we will have to hold the baby until everything is quiet. We can not make any appointment just now. We know very well what it means it is. It is really necessary to make a world affair out of this, or to get your baby back as soon as possible to settle the affair in a quick way will be better for both. Don't buy afraid about the baby, keeping care of us day and night. We also will feed him according to the diet. Page 2 We are interested to send him back in good health. Last ransom was made us for $50,000. But now we have to take another person to it and probable have to keep the baby for a longer time as we expected. So the amount will be $70,000, $20,000 in $50 bills, $25,000 in $20 bills, $15,000 in $10 bills, and $10,000 in $5 bills. Don't mark any bills or take in them from one serial number. We will inform you later where to deliver the money but we will note to do so until the police is out of the case and the papers are quiet. The kidnapping we prepared in years, so we are prepared for everything. A third ransom note was received by the Lindbergh's attorney two days later, on March 8th. In that lengthy letter, the writer said that the Fred Charles wanted to use as a go-between would not be accepted. The ransom writer requested a note written in the newspaper instead. That day, a newspaper note was published which suggested a retired school principal, Dr. Condon, to work with the kidnapper and offered an additional $1,000. I offer all I can scrape together so a loving mother may again have her child, and Colonel Lindbergh may know that the American people are grateful for the honor bestowed upon them by his pluck and daring. Let the kidnappers know that no testimony of mine or information coming from me will be used against them. I offer $1,000 from which I have saved for my salary as additional to the suggested ransom of $50,000, which is said to have been demanded by Colonel Lindbergh. I stand ready at my own expense to go anywhere, alone, to give the kidnapper the extra money and promise never to utter his name to any person. If this is not agreeable, then I ask the kidnappers to go to any Catholic priest and return the child unharmed with the knowledge that any priest must hold inviolate any statement which may be made by the kidnappers. A fourth ransom note was received by Dr. Condon the next day, accepting him as a go-between. March 10th, nine days after the baby went missing, Dr. Condon was given the $70,000 ransom money and negotiations began through the newspaper. The code name Jeff C. was used for the negotiator in the newspaper. March 12th, a cab driver delivered a fifth ransom note to Dr. Condon, which he said was given to him by an unknown person. That letter said they would find a sixth note underneath a stone, 100 feet away from a subway station. The instructions on that note told Dr. Condon to meet with a man who called himself John at a cemetery. He did. Charles demanded that no police be present for the meeting and that no prior surveillance would be done. 
Dr. Condon and John discussed payment of the ransom money. More newspaper notes were made, urging the kidnapper to go through with the ransom delivery and exchange of the baby. March 16th, the baby's pajamas and a seventh ransom note were delivered to Dr. Condon. There were more newspaper letters exchanged. On March 21st, an eighth ransom note was received, reiterating that the kidnapping had been planned for a year. March 30th, a ninth ransom note threatened to increase the ransom to $100,000. April 1st, a tenth ransom note instructed Dr. Condon to have the money ready the next day. April 2nd, the 11th ransom note was delivered to Dr. Condon by a taxi driver, directing him to find the 12th ransom note under a stone in front of a greenhouse. The 12th note led to Dr. Condon meeting with John again, where he asked to reduce the ransom to $50,000. He gave the $50,000 to John, got a receipt, and the 13th and final ransom note. That note said that they would be able to find the baby on a boat named Nellie near Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. But little Charlie was not there. He wasn't anywhere. May 12, 1932. A truck driver pulled over on a highway so he could relieve himself. He accidentally, and tragically, came upon the body of the Lindbergh's baby. That location was about two and a half miles away from the Lindbergh's home. The little one was partially buried, mummified, and missing parts. There was a clear, obvious hole in the crushed skull. The coroner was not able to positively identify the remains, as it was in such bad shape. Charles, however, said, I am perfectly satisfied that this is my child. He then approved and ordered cremation of the baby. For two years, nothing happened in this case. Money that had been used in the ransom randomly appeared in different places along the East Coast. It was obvious because the money used were gold certificates, which were readily being recalled by the U.S. government. One such certificate was traced to a man named Bruno, who was then arrested. Bruno was also in possession of $15,000 from the ransom money. He was immediately found guilty in the court of public opinion. Things didn't add up, though. The money had been found wrapped in a newspaper from 1934, but the ransom exchanged hands in 1932. Bruno's wife and others alibied him for the night of the kidnapping, and he did not fit the profile created by law enforcement. Bruno was found guilty of first-degree murder and given the death sentence. Before his trip to the electric chair, he was offered life in prison if he would confess to the crime. He refused. Bruno was put to death in April 1936. But was Bruno guilty? The night of the kidnapping was terribly windy and rainy. If someone had climbed the very tall ladder after having walked through the muddy grounds, then they must have levitated into the room and hoisted the 35-pound boy into the air and down the ladder by way of Tinkerbell's fairy dust, because nothing was out of place. There were no muddy footprints. There were traces of mud, but nothing was wet and no one heard anything. The only people that knew that Anne, Charles, and baby Charles were going to be in the house that night were the servants. It was the first time they had ever stayed there during the week. Charles was supposed to have been at a speaking event that night, but he no-showed. That night, he insisted that no one enter the baby's room until 10 p.m., a very specific time frame. And here's the thing. Everyone in the house was awake. The house was two floors, but it was quite compact and very small. How had someone kidnapped the little boy without anyone hearing? Further, how did they find the newly built house? which was not easy to find back in a wooded area. And how did they know which room exactly was the baby's nursery? How did they carry that huge rickety ladder with no one noticing? 
across a huge field. Someone was given the death penalty for kidnapping and murdering the Lindbergh's baby. But could it be that Charles was displeased with the health concerns of his little boy and created a jumbled mess of an investigation with 13 ransom notes and bizarre meetings in a cemetery where no police were allowed? Was he trying to give himself time to dispose of the imperfect boy? And what about the $50,000 ransom note sent to Anne's youngest sister, Constance? Is that not a bit coincidental? Charles and Anne went on to have five more healthy children. Oh, and one last thing. Genetic testing has shown an additional seven children that Charles fathered outside of his marriage to Anne. It seems that the man who mocked other pilots as being womanizers and engaging in superficial romances may have given himself some vacations from his own strict rules. <laughs>